Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here among naturalists and conservationists. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity for me. I'll be talking about deer and forests mostly. There's a lot of expertise in this room. Um, a lot of what I show you might not be new, but maybe there'll be some new and interesting things. So in addition to you know, monitoring deer impacts and traveling as I do, I'm also very interested in the human dimensions of this issue. Um, so I always try to learn. I gather stories like I used to collect plant specimens. How many people in this room have contracted a tick-borne disease? You might look around and get a sense of this. All right, how many of you are deer hunters? Fewer. How many of you have struck a deer with your car? OK, now this one was for those deer hunters who raised their hands. How many deer hunters have salvaged roadkill deer? <laughs> or even if you're not a deer hunter. All right, well, I just thought I'd have some fun with that. Um, Without further ado, let's see, let's put this in a broad perspective. You know, we just saw this great presentation about aquatic ecosystems and human influences on it. Well, look what Rachel Carson says. It's good advice. Nature has introduced great variety, but man has displayed a passion for simplifying it. He undoes the checks and balances. And with the deer issue and so many other environmental problems we have, um, this is the root problem. And, you know, Rachel wrote Silent Spring. Um, White-tailed deer are having a very dramatic effect, not so much on chestnut-sided warblers, but things like towhees, wood thrushes, black and white warblers, ruffed grouse. Uh, I wonder how she would feel today that we are in the midst of another Silent Spring. You know, you go to some of these conservation lands in Southhold, and you go out with ace birders like John Sepp, and, You'll hear, oh, there used to be towhees here and wood thrushes. So we're in this, this other silent spring. Also, we are in what I call a scentless spring. You know, as Tim mentioned, you go to many of these forests and they're missing flowers. I mean, you don't expect many wildflowers on very acid, heathy soils, but on the rich pockets where there used to be flowers, they're gone. So this is this, you know, almost Eastern US crisis of, of a scentless spring. So Aldo Leopold, you know, he still guides us, I think. He wrote a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of a biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise, right and wrong. Natural resource managers, conservation organizations. This is the acid test of your work. Um, is your land healthy? Of course, this sentence embodies the land ethic that Leopold uh, developed and, you know, when I was an undergraduate at UMass, my undergraduate advisor received his PhD under Leopold. So my god, we students, we heard ad nauseum about Leopold. We used to joke that we had to bow to Wisconsin every morning to pay homage. And, you know, as an undergrad, it didn't quite sink in. But by god, you know, it, it's all come to be crystally clear to me. I, uh, it's a great, great challenge. We have to keep this foremost in our minds. I asked my advisor once, I said, you know, what was Aldo like? And you know, back then, the Wallach professor was smoking his big pipe. You could smoke in colleges back then, by the way. Uh, and he, he looked at me, he said, he was such a nice man. Then his next sentence, he said, it was so sad to witness the vicious attacks he endured because of his views on deer management. So back in 1943, after deer started to starve in Wisconsin, Leopold convinced the state to have its first antlerless deer season. And a record number of deer were killed, but there was such a backlash, Leopold was shouted down. And they went back to you know, protecting the mama deer, building the deer herds. So if, if Leopold had prevailed in 1943, we wouldn't be in this pickle. But you know, there were powerful forces at work then. There are still powerful forces at work now. And finally, a contemporary expert, Gary Alt, he used to work for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. His quote is, deer are second only to humans in their influence on forest ecosystems. You know, Gary gave about 150 talks across Pennsylvania, 
try, mainly to hunting and sportsmen's groups, trying to get them more involved and take a more active role in bringing balance to the deer herd. Um, like Leopold, he was uh, more so than Leopold. I think he was threatened and ended up quitting his job. But he was a great crusader um, for this, trying to find a balance. So that sets the stage with some of these folks. And locally on Long Island, I, there are still some heroes who are working hard on this. You know, Mike Scheibel, John Sepp, John Rasweiler, Steve Young, and Jeff Standish. You know, they're racking their brains out here at a place, Tall Pines and Southhold. You know, what to do? They were trying to take this on with one hand tied behind their back. Um, there's little outside money you can turn to because this issue is you know, way too contentious and politically dangerous. Um, there's statutes, there's laws on the book that limit what you can and cannot do with deer and deer management. The deer belong to all of us. Um, so it's a really tough pickle, but they are making progress. There's dialogue. Of course, there's a lot of newspaper um, stories about this. And there's consensus. You know, consensus is not unanimous. Yeah, I consider if you get 51% of the town to vote for a certain action, that's a consensus. Um, so just some suggested reading, um, Deer Land, Nature Wars, some more technical book, Wildlife and Society, The Science of Human Dimensions. And the last one is something I wrote. It's, it's online. It's a guide to deer impact assessment. And I'll be working from that a lot today. I'll be showing lots of pretty pictures to hopefully keep you awake and interested. These are the contents of that guide I put together. Um, talk about fenced areas. And one thing that I never saw people write about or talk about, that deer impacts are never uniform. You can have one part of a forest where the deer are skittish, with this lot of human activity, and the vegetation will be much better developed than in the forest interiors, say, where uh, the deer are more comfortable and have a greater impact. Here today, gone tomorrow, it's really hard to say that a deer, overabundant deer, had wiped out a, a plant species. Because if you look hard enough, they're still out there. They're tiny. Um, they may be in little refugia. But the, the big point there is that those plants may still be present, but they've lost their functional role in those ecosystems. They no longer produce flowers that can nourish uh, insect pollinators. They don't produce fruits that would nourish uh, wildlife, etc. They don't provide the structure that's so important for so many insects and other wildlife species. So I mentioned I was going to talk about deer and forest, but I'm also throwing in this idea of people us because we're such a major force on this planet and on Long Island. You know, in the good old days, wildlife biologists dealt in this intersection, foresters dealt in this part, and never the two did meet in the middle. And still today, there's some turf issues. You know, when I find myself creeping over here you know, I get a little pushback from the wildlife crowd, and I say, wait, no, this is part of my circle, too. So we all have to meet here in the middle, which means we have to make this a multidisciplinary uh, activity. You know, as a botanist, I need to learn about wildlife biology. As a wildlife biologist, they need to learn to develop ways to monitor vegetation, etc. And, you know, every situation is, I think the only constant here with, is deer, the white-tailed deer. They are the same, but you may be in you know, different eco-regions, different plant communities, and certainly the human aspect changes wildly across the country. Um, so a lot of variables that go into ecosystem management. So this is you know, why we, this is what motivates us, and again, to reinforce the point, if you don't have the plant, you don't have the insect, and you get cascading ecological effects. So we know only just a minuscule bit about how this one stressor, the white-tailed deer, the keystone species, how it is, its effects are trickling down right into probably nutrient, uh, altering nutrient regimes too, I would think. 
Uh, this is Canada lily. You all folks down here probably have Turks cap lily. Same deal. Dear love, all members of the lilies just about. So again, wildlife belongs to all of us. It doesn't cost you anything to enjoy it or photograph it, but if you want to uh, harvest one for your personal consumption, you need to buy a, a license. And um, it, it's a user pay, user benefit relationship, as many of you know. It's quite possible that deer provide more benefits than any other mammal. At the same time, they cause more harm and injuries. So that's the flip side of this. Um, the woman who hit the, anyone have an estimate of, yeah, I've been curious, some states don't track roadkill mortality. It's very hard, some of them get scooped up, a lot of them are underreported. But in Connecticut, they did a good study and they found that about 18,000 roadkills was their estimate per year. And their hunter harvest is about 14,000. So more deer are being killed and wasted on the roads than harvested by hunters and put to good use. Um, you know, as a society, looking at that, it just makes me sick. You know, how would we at least half the number of road kills to get it to 9,000? What would that take? We would have to increase the hunting um, a lot more, and, and that's part of the problem. New York State, I heard an estimate recently from Paul Curtis, about 100,000 deer per year get killed and mostly wasted. So the white-tailed deer, it's prolific, it's smart, it's got great senses, it's adaptable. For millions of years, it's had to evade predators, including us. For 11,000 years after glaciation, Homo sapiens, it is believed, was the major predator of white-tailed deer. Homo sapiens is the greatest predator this planet, nature has ever produced. You know, we can't run down a gazelle and dispatch it with a bite in the neck. We can't swim underwater and catch fish in our teeth. We can't fly on the wing and echolocate insects, but we have a mind that developed fire, hook and line, bow and arrow, gunpowder, natural poisons, ingenious methods of prey deception. All this has made us the planet's greatest predator. You know, nowadays, a lot of our predation is done in factory uh, slaughterhouses, but you know, just leading up to this, you know, maybe we could be proud to say that we wiped out the mastodon, the cave bear, the Irish elk. I mean, look what we did accomplish in these recent thousand years. So as is true all across, especially Long Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, we've seen deer populations skyrocket. In Connecticut, at least, it's corresponded with a decline in open agricultural land and an increase in forest land. And coincidentally, this is when the states assume management responsibility for uh, deer management. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is the rest of my talk, basically. You know, deer and, and plants. So deer eat lots of plants in the woods. They eat plants in your yards. They eat them in cemeteries, in agricultural fields, which is not an insignificant problem here on Long Island, I am learning. Oh my gosh. Sometimes we feed them, right? <laughs> But you know they'll also strip bark off hemlock or witch hazel. And I found a spot in Rhode Island where they would tear up the ground to get the tubers of um, Indian cucumber root. It took me two or three years to figure out why they were digging up the ground right deep. Sometimes they'll eat mushrooms growing on logs. And they actually eat like baby birds too. There's some obscure literature that they will eat nestlings. So bucks, they rub their antlers on saplings, another form of damage. Deer directly affect the growth of plants. Here's a photograph of a yellow lady slipper, six days apart. You can tell it's the same plant by the, the hole in the leaf. So this is my real tearjerker photo, if any of you like orchids. So chronic browsing, there's a term here that you'll, you'll come across, and you might want to look for this too. It's called a recalcitrant understory. Recalcitrant means stubborn and difficult to manage, like some people I know. But once this gets established, this fern understory, 
it is there and it's very difficult for anything else to get reestablished. So this is the legacy effect. If all the deer were removed tomorrow from this forest, it may take decades and decades for anything to be able to grow when, within this uh, dense fern understory. Now, in Pennsylvania, I understand there's about a million acres of this. They call it fern park or fern savanna. It's very tough stuff. On Long Island, we have another recalcitrant species, uh, black huckleberry. It's not too preferred by the deer. It takes advantage of the extra sunlight that develops when trees fall and no young saplings are coming in. And once that's established, um, it's very hard to deal with. <laughs> you can't really get new trees established in there. So a picture from uh, Dutchess County, but this is the so-called Hampton haircut, right? You all know about that. A shot from southeastern Massachusetts, a clear browse line on cedar. Uh, deer exclosures you know, have been used a lot. They're quite illustrative. This fence has been up probably close to 15 or 20 years. And you know, that's, these are the woods I remember, but now it's all barren out there. Yes, and deer do love poison ivy. Some people will say, oh, that's good. Uh, this particular spot was a, a three-acre infestation of, of Japanese stilt grass found in Rhode Island. And the foresters said, oh my god, what should we do? Because up till then, people said, spray it, get Boy Scouts to pull it. But it didn't address the root cause of the problem. There's a, there's a humongous deer herd up there in Situate, Rhode Island. And the stilt grass was a symptom of that bigger problem. So they took my advice and built a three-acre fence around it. And in three years, the stilt grass was gone, except along the Little Woods Road. So you, you have to work with nature, under, uh, define the stressors. You can still see some little stilt grasses outside. But it didn't take long. These, that was a fairly fertile site, so I knew the rubus would spring up and the poison ivy worked like a charm. Also, you know, be observant. This is a stormwater retention basin. There's lots of these on Long Island. This is behind a school in Andover. We had students, sixth graders, measuring the trees inside and outside of that fence. Or this fence around a fire tower. Two of the greatest nectar-bearing plants that I come across are bristly sarsaparilla and pink dogbane. If any of you like insects, butterflies, native bees, you find these plants and they just suck in the, the pollinators. Of course, outside this fence, they may, the plants may be there. They have no functional role. And you can look for these little refugia inaccessible ledges. I say in my publication that deer are not mountain goats, although they can get you know, up your patio steps. They can be very adept in getting on steep soils. But you can see how the uh, wild sarsaparilla was protected on that slope there. Also, the limbs of fallen trees can give you good clues because they'll protect an area for a number of years. It's a barrier for the deer to move in. And you, you look at that, and you say, oh my god, you know, those things are flowering under those branches. There's a word I had to invent called herbivocline. A cline is a type of gradient. I was seeing these gradients in the intensity of herbivory. So if you begin at a frightening feature, like a road or a parking lot or a trailhead where the deer are skittish, you don't see much deer impact. But with distance away, you see more and more impact. So yeah, I, I use this picture to illustrate how frightening you know, 100 high school students could be to deer. I also had to talk about rabbits. You know, they, they, they only grow so tall. But when the snow is deep, you could find browse damage, you know, three, four feet tall. Um, rabbits, what they'll do, and I've taken thousands of pictures of rabbits, um, they will snip off a stem, you know, standing as high as they can, bring it to the ground, and then eat the whole thing. So it's different than a deer that will just nip off the, the ends of these things. The rabbits will break off, a, snip off a branch, bring it down, and silently not till it's all gone. So, you know, deer have preferences just like us. Um, they do not like mile a minute, right, Steve Young? Um, 
They do not like inkberry. Some of these plants are poisonous or have thorns. They generally don't like ferns or pitch pine is, is a low preference species. When you find impacts on low preference species, that's a pretty good sign that the deer are having a negative impact on the forest. You know, American beech has been described as a relatively low preference plant, and that's one reason why I find it so useful and others have. You know, if the beech is being suppressed, it's a sure sign that the more uh, preferred tree saplings are being suppressed. You know, one thing I've done many different areas, we, we monitor the growth response of beech sprouts. So if a deer management program is successful, that should be the first indicator, because they've got all this energy, the parent tree, just pumping energy up to this little sapling. Um, they're shade tolerant, so they can grow you know, 19 inches a year. So it's a great thing to study. You know, here I just illustrated that you, know, you take the measurements in early spring, they grow taller by late summer. By the next spring, they're short. Then they grow up. So there's some browsing taking place during the winter. Um, if you just measured this once a year, you wouldn't see this up and down phenomenon. And then you have to interpret those graphs. I mean, this is the same site. You know, are they getting shorter here and getting taller here? It could be. It could be the variation in this one area because of more human traffic in one area. The beaches grow taller. Um, we set up some plots at Mashamic Preserve, and you know, I show this to people where we've been monitoring the beech sprouts and their static growth. They're not doing anything. I said, well, at Mashamic, they can grow 10, oops, 10 inches a year on average. These are like 50 stems each. So this is a result of intensive hunting at Mashamic Preserve, coupled with some local nuis or nuisance permit, depredation permit shooting that took place in the town. So it was very encouraging. That's your first indicator, a simple metric. Are they getting taller or shorter? All right, so some preferred plants, you know, lady slippers, people bemoan the loss of them, viburnums. Flowering dogwood is facing double trouble, anthracnose is killing the bigger ones, and deer are eating the little ones. And you know, there are some exotic plants that deer love, and winged euonymus or burning bush is one of them. They'll also eat bittersweet and privet, as many of you know. Um, so the deer are having an impact on, on invasive plants too in a, by suppressing them. Some plants like garlic mustard, Japanese stiltgrass, uh, the deer hardly touch those, so those increase dramatically. Hobble bush, any of you who've hiked in the Adirondacks, this is the dominant understory. Um, in the Allegheny uplands, where I looked at an area, um, none of the plants flower over thousands of acres. When you find a little patch of it, they're knee high or shorter because this is deer candy. The deer love this. So at this one 5,000 acre forest, which was the first in New York to receive deer management assistance program antlerless tags, called DMAP tags. Private landowners could get these to help um, you know, reduce deer impacts in this property, but this was the first state forest in New York that, gave, that received these tags. So the state gave the tags to themselves. So hunters would stop by the office, use the tag for a week, and, and the goal was to try to get forest regeneration back on track because the foresters were not having any luck. You know, this is in the wood basket of New York State, Shenango County, the beautiful Allegheny Uplands. So we've been monitoring that for five years and looking at this one species, yes, it's highly preferred. What do the data show us after five years? Well, you tell me. Again, this is that same up and down thing. Okay, late summer, early spring, late summer, early spring, late summer, early spring, late summer. At least with this one indicator, there's not much indication to, to see any release from deer browse pressure. White trillium, you know, this is also deer candy, I think, out in central and western New York. It's harder to deal with herbaceous plants because as soon as they're up, the deer are starting to eat them. So when we set up a monitoring program in 2009, this was May 7th, an average of 
10 per 100 square meter circular plot. So I said, I'm going to be a good scientist. I'm coming back May 7th, exactly the next year. So there's May 7th. They were down at two and a half. And I said, oh my god, at this rate, they'll be gone in a couple years. I came back the next year. Oh, they're up again. You, then it was obvious to me, or it should have been obvious earlier, spring came very early in 2010. So by May 7th, those plants were already up you know, 10 days longer than they were up the previous year. So it just shows you some of the problems of monitoring herbaceous plants. We looked at them about a week apart, and they went from 8 to 4, from 14 to 7. It just shows you how dramatically, and over a short window of time, some of these herbaceous plants are being wiped out. But we, we are detecting what I think we all would agree is, is this increasing trend for reasons we don't quite understand, because we don't have the harvest data for that one specific spot. We know it's hunted. Um, so it, it, it works both ways. It's not a cut and dry. It's all interpretive when you have these data sets. You know, you just have to convince folks. All right, just a little tour of some of the places I visited, deer and packs. Plum Island, that beautiful uh, Solomon seal plant. There's virtually no deer there because um, they have to be removed to prevent the potential transmission of diseases like hoof and mouth from the uh, animal disease lab to the mainland. So you see uh, plants like this in full stature, a lot of greenery that you don't see now much of uh, elsewhere on Long Island. We didn't get a single dog t a deer tick or a single lone star tick when we were there. We did one person had one dog tick from walking around. Again, it was like a different planet. The Ruth Oliver Conservation Area, hammered. And the people who live near these places for 20 or 30 years, they're so disgusted. They get it. They, want, they remember these forests when they were pleasant, they had flowers, had birds. With Shamic Preserve, we, we were worried about forest disintegration. You know, this was Hurricane Sandy damage. Um, but there's no new trees taking their place. And a big storm is going to wipe out these trees. And unless we can depress the deer herd, um, these will become black huckleberry heathlands. The Grace Estate, 500 acres, it's hunted, uh, totally hammered. Another picture, of, this is a sandier soil site, so you don't see huckleberry. Up the Hudson Valley, Harriman State Park is a place I visited, and it's over 20,000 acres. You know, and it's New York City's outdoor hiking natural wonderland. And you go there, there's no kiosk talking about deer impacts, but the forest there is crumbling. You could drive a car through those woods. Those are beech sprouts, six inches tall. Um, forests impacted by deer have no resilience to disturbance. So if a fire comes, that's going to accelerate the disintegration of the forest. They can't spring back. And you know, how many trees per acre does it take to call it a forest? When is that no longer a forest? And I'm very, very concerned about this. As was Dick Mitchell, 18 years ago, he wrote this about Harriman. He explored it all over, found terrible impacts. 18 years ago, you think anything's been done? No. There's a lot of willful blindness and people turning a blind eye to this problem. It's just too contentious, too controversial. There's no pots of money to tap into. It's politically risky. 18 years after Mitchell wrote that, nothing. Binghamton University, they're trying to do their best. They've got a density of, I think it was 136 deer per square mile. They know that because they flew the university and counted them with infrared photography. Um, they were all about to do a sharp shooting event a couple years ago, and then the university president thought it was too controversial uh, and nixed it. So the university professors are mounting all kinds of evidence to try to get them to do something, because this is their outdoor classrooms. This forest, the natural, is right on the BU campus, and students are there every day looking at forest ecology stuff, botany stuff, and they're in a cesspool of a natural area, and they need to fix it. But you know, there's resistance and no big pots of money. 
Just one other place, many of you have been to Montezuma Refuge. Uh, just about all national wildlife refuges are hunted, including Wertheim nearby. Um, very severe impacts locally on this refuge. You know, elsewhere, you know, a couple miles away, the forest may be healthier. So there we study anything that can be studied. In this case, spice bush. You can look at, you know, if we were to remeasure this one, you know, last year this used to be alive, now it's shrunk down. So we just look at height. And sometimes we have fun. It's a nice cooperative effort between the state and the feds and New York Audubon. Lime Hollow Center for Environment and Culture in Cortland. Uh, Peter Harrity is the assistant director there. He's got a gr they get so many children through their nature programs. And Peter has hooked them up into uh, vegetation monitoring. So the citizen science holds a lot of, uh, of hope, I think, in this whole endeavor, because the whole communities get behind it when kids are involved. So another term that didn't exist, I had to invent eco-environmental gentrification. You can think of it going back hundreds of years in North America when we tamed the wilderness. We shot the wolves and cougars. We gentrified it. Uh, and in the 20th century, when so many of these little conservation lands were protected, aha, great conservation achievement. Well, now let's get rid of the unsavory characters. No hunting. No hunting because Hunters kill animals, and they threaten human health and safety, right? So get the hunters out. So we, we gentrified all these natural lands by excluding the major predators. But the unintended consequence is that we thought we'd be safer without bullets and arrows flying through the air. We're not. We're getting tick-borne diseases. We're hitting deer with our cars. Are wildlife safer, that we're not shooting them with bullets and arrows? No, there's biotic homogenization. And um, it's, as I said, they've become, what, what's the term, Steve Young? Ecological slums, you, you coined. So the, again, the other big fact is suburban sprawl. <laughs> you know a little bit about that here on Long Island. Uh, you know, 50 years difference, there wasn't this road, there wasn't this development. And in Massachusetts, where this picture was taken, you have to be 500 feet from a house in order to hunt, or 150 feet from a road. So all of a sudden, the deer have all this refuge land where no one can, can get them. White-tailed deer overabundance has various definitions. I like the last one, and it's a consensus determination that negative impacts outweigh positive. And that's exactly what happened at some of these town meetings, like in Southhold, when the public show up and the town supervisor determines that, yes, there is a consensus that these negative impacts outweigh. We don't want it that way. We want the positive benefits to far outweigh these negative impacts. So Tom Rooney talked, wrote a paper, identify six criteria if you have too many deer. Uh, is the vegetation hammered? Are uh, the deer in poor condition? Are they infected with parasites? Are they transmitting them to people? Is there significant economic losses? And finally, are people at greater risk from uh, vehicle collisions? This woman who got injured, she was in her 70s. She did survive, but it was a horrible mess. So I'm encouraged. Julie walked in. She sent a stage there in her tick whites, uh, folks from East Hampton. Uh, as I said, we are making progress. We are right, we're gaining more understanding about this complex issue. And there are good people on the ground making a difference. I love deer hunters. Uh, this kid is my son. And that's his first deer at age 14. Hunters have an important role to play, but they can't be so greedy. Just try to understand that for the good of all, if we can reduce the herds to a certain level, I mean, hunters have never had it this good. This is like off the charts. Hunters expect to shoot eight, 10 deer with their bow. This is abnormal. You know, we hunters can live with a reduced herd. Landowners play a big role. And traditional hunting doesn't always reduce deer herds. This was a paper published in 2013. These New Jersey hunters threw everything they could at the deer. Then they flew over and counted the deer, and they, they couldn't get it below about 40. 
I wish traditional hunting could. So if you want to solve the problem, first you need insight, and I hope you gained a little bit more of that today. You need empathy for the deer themselves that get sick, that get tragically killed on roads, for the people, the farmers, uh, children who get Lyme disease, action. You know, if you have this great empathy that compels you to act. And we are seeing more of that. In fact, right here at the Brookhaven National Lab, there was a culling, highly successful this winter, and perseverance. So it doesn't matter what values you want to preserve or enhance, you're having negative impacts on all of them. And professionals from many fields, many of you in this audience, are great candidates for this, need to get involved. Because this will require a lot of integrative thinking to get creative solutions. So thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. Uh, please go to the mic. I'd be interested in your thoughts on Smilax as a recalcitrant species, considering that its photosynthetic thorny stems survive perfectly fine after the deer completely defoliate them, and we have these seemingly monoculture understories of Smilax in some areas. I think that would certainly fit the bill as one at Mashamak. Once it's totally established, it's just a jungle, and the deer can't even walk in there. When it's short and young, it's a preferred plant. So it's very similar to multi-flora rose, which also has thorny defense. A real small multi-flora rose, deer love it. But once it gets bigger and it gets a thorny armature, it becomes quite resistant. But that's a good question, and it's... OK, thank you. OK, uh, we are now at our break, so yeah. Thank you very much.